All right. I'm Sarah Veseloff. And I'm Frederick Philip Von Weiss. And thank you so much for consuming the Thunder Nerds, a conversation with the people behind the technology that love what they do and do tech good. Hey, welcome everybody to the show. Really appreciate you joining us once again. Um, first, just want to say thank you to uh, the team at DevFest, um, Hendrix, Michael, having us down there. We uh, were there for uh, all day on Saturday, November 16th, covering the conference. It was an amazing event. Sarah, you got anything to add to that? Ah, it was awesome. And by the end, I finally knew how to say Oviedo Mall. So it was good. Good practice for me. <laughs> Yeah, it was really cool to get to uh, interview all the speakers and see everyone and uh, just just really appreciate being a part of the event. And uh, thanks for uh, Google for sponsoring that too. So without any further ado, why don't we just go ahead and jump into our guest? We have an amazing human being here today. I want to read all these points correctly. We have co-founder of uh, Perch CMS, which we'll certainly dive into, web developer, editor-in-chief, of Smashing Magazine, speaker, runner, Rachel Andrew. Welcome to the show, Rachel. Hello, it's good to be here. <laughs> yeah, we're really happy to have you. Uh, I know we got to speak a long time ago. I think maybe it was like two years ago, a year ago, at an event apart for like a little bit, but it's, it's, it's great to have you on for a full episode. Uh, you're joining us from, the, from uh, Bristol, correct? Am I yes, saying that yes. Right? yes, I'm in Bristol in the UK. Yeah, you gotta, uh, I, I don't know all my UK cities yet, but I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I think you're probably like a good six hour time difference from us. Yeah, I'm a five from EST. Where are you? You're, are you in Central? Uh, no, we're Eastern. in... You're Eastern, yeah. yes. We're, we're five. We're five yeah. at the moment. Um, no, not, yeah. not too bad. Yeah, well, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. So, um, Rachel... Um, I'd love to dive into a little bit first about um, some context about you for maybe people that uh, under rock that don't know you or maybe people that, because um, <laughs> there are they some. They must be under a rock. They, they must be under a rock. Well, I, I, they I, must I, be. I, like to, I don't know how they I would like, know who you are. <laughs> I, I, I like to think about it this way, is that there's always a lot of new people coming yes. up mm -hmm. in, in our industry. And there's a lot of people that are second career devs, third career <laughs> devs, that are, you know, are new to the industry and are, are getting to know some of the people that are the influencers, the people that inspire everyone. So if, do you mind just providing a little bit of context about who you are? Mm, sure. So yeah, I'm, I'm a web developer. I've been doing web development for really over 20 years at this point, which makes me very old and quite tired. Um, <laughs> but I still, I still really enjoy, enjoy this business. Um, I've also been independent. I've been running my own business um, since 2001. Uh, so I haven't really had a proper job since then. Um, and so I do various different things. Um, at the moment, I am editor-in-chief of Smashing Magazine. So if you read any articles there, um, that's, that's one of the things that I do. Um, I have a couple of products. I've got Perch CMS and Noticed, which is uh, a product for sharing slides, essentially, as for speakers. And I also do various bits of web development and things. And I write a lot. I've written an awful lot of books um, and articles and so on. Um, and I'm on the CSS Working Group for the W3C. Uh, I'm a, a member of the group. I represent Frontiers, who are a Dutch organization of web developers. And so I sort of represent them on, on the working group. I love that. I I imagine the way that if someone asked, how did you become a web developer? How did you get into this? It probably goes back to that um, saying, well, you just started building websites and your career just went from there, right? Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think like most people of my generation, we got into yeah. this very early on. Um, and there wasn't a lot to learn. I mean, I, I predate CSS, yeah. so there was just HTML. Um, <laughs> so, so I learned HTML, then I learned Perl, because if you wanted to do any kind of server-side stuff at the time, you pretty much oh, had wow. to learn Perl. Um, and then I learned CSS as it sort of became useful, because the first browsers that I developed for didn't have CSS support. You know, I remember um, IE3 appearing, and, and CSS being something that was in that browser. Um, so yeah, I think at the time that was how you got into it. You know, you start, you built a website because you wanted to share something. For me, it was baby photos. Um, I was a, a young mum. Um, I had my daughter, uh, really the only way to put anything online at the time was to build a website because there was no Facebook or Flickr or 
anything. If you wanted to put things online, you built a website. So I built a website so I could put things online. Um, and then I was the person that everyone knew in my sort of social circle who could build websites. And so it really went from there that I was then being paid to build websites for people. And I think that's a pretty common story for someone who started in 96, 97, because that, would, that was really, you know, there were very few of us really who, would, who were doing this stuff. Yeah, I remember the exact same thing. I started building websites in 98, uh, right after college. And uh, it, it was one of those things where I made a website for my band. And then my other uh, friends that had bands wanted websites for their band. And they're like, oh, I know Frederick could build a website. And then I just started building websites and, mm. you, know, you know, just kind of went from there. And I think it's interesting, too, because you, you, you pointed out that you had a need to put up your or want, I guess, whatever you want to say, to, to put up your the, the baby pictures. And I think um, a lot of times products organically kind of grow from that need, just mm -hmm. like uh, Perch, right? Like you said, mm -hmm. probably there wasn't many options at the moment for a CMS like this. And I, I think still there really isn't many options for a CMS like this because it's I, I love the beauty of it, which, and I'll, I'll let you explain it because you, uh, obviously you could explain it far better than, than I could, but, but I, I just want to communicate that I love the beauty of how it, you build your website the way you build it, and then you just leverage Perch to kind of work uh, with your website rather than building your website into the CMS. Like a mm -hmm. lot of times you'll have things like Drupal or WordPress, not to bash them because they're great, but things like Drupal or WordPress, where um, sometimes if you want to build upon the CMS, you're, you, you get a lot of extra code if, if you don't know what you're doing, like if mm -hmm. you're a beginner. But with this, if you're a beginner, you could just start building your CMS um, right into your website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's really where it came from. I mean, our background, I mean, by the time we built Perch, my husband was working with me and we were mostly doing large scale custom content management projects. Um, so sort of fairly big things that would go on for ages. There were a lot of work um, and we did those primarily for design agencies. So they'd have a need for their client would have a need for some sort of large scale content management. We would do it. Um, and then the design agencies would say, oh, we've got this little project as well. We don't want to use WordPress. Um, what can you recommend? And we'd be like, well, we haven't really got anything because we do these big projects, you know? <laughs> um, so that's really where, where Perch came from. We were already doing this template based thing um, with our big CMS projects. And so we wanted to do something that was kind of like that, but that actually our web designer clients could probably do for themselves um, rather than us do it for them. Uh, we could just sort of sell it as, 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 a, as a product. Um, and that's really where that came from. And that was in, in 2009, we launched Perch. So it's been going for a very long time. Um, and it's, you know, there's still a need for that sort of thing. There's still small sites that need a drop in solution, you know, that's, um, so yeah, yeah. So, so Perch sort of, sort of carries on and, and, um, and yeah, it's, it's been, it's been sort of a big part of our lives, uh, uh, for the last 10 years. Wow. Things have changed quite a bit. Uh, I'm just talking about how you started and, and Frederick sharing his, and mine is very similar again. I, I needed a, a website, so I learned how to build one and then people are like, oh, hey, you know how to build them. You know, it's astounding to me how how much it has changed over the past 15, 20 years. Um, and I'm sure that you feel the same. I'm just curious, kind of, do you feel like, sometimes I'm, I, I gotta say, I, I'm nostalgic for when I could do everything and I didn't need to be like, oh God, I gotta find somebody that can do this. Otherwise I'm not gonna be able to get past this point. How do you feel about the state we're in in the web and, and, and kind of where things are going? Yeah, I think... I think there are still people doing small websites. I think less so. I think that because a lot of those clients probably go off and use something like Squarespace um, rather than having a web designer come and do things. I do think, though, that stuff like the kind of interesting static sites and the Jamstack stuff is a little bit of people saying, oh, I want to be able to do all this for myself. I don't want to have to worry about servers and ops and all that side of things. Um, yeah. And so I think, you know, there is there is still, I think, a need for people being able to put things up quickly. And we, and we sort of see that. Um, and yeah, but I think there was that there was a nice time when you could walk into a client's office and you knew that anything they would ask you, you could pretty much just do. Um, <laughs> and that doesn't really happen anymore. You know, it's like, no. you, you can't, you can't go and see a client and think, yes, I'm going to be able to handle all of this. You know, um, there were, even, even people who, you know, would call themselves full stack. I mean, 
when I started, if you wanted to do anything server side, you were in the situation of, you know, first compile Apache. Um, <laughs> it was, um, yeah. so, you know, it, it's, things have changed greatly um, over these 20 years. And yeah, you know, I think us people who started in the beginning do miss a little bit that being this sort of lone nerd who could build websites. Um, I, th I think you could t also take that too, like different ways. Like you could look at it as it got complicated and it got simple um, mm -hmm. just cool. to play devil's advocate, because oh, I think yeah. in a way like, like you could leverage all these APIs now and, you, you know, do these things like you could just, Oh, I'll, I'll have a store. Thank you. And, boop, yeah. boop, and, and like, yeah. I, I didn't need a backend developer for that. Yeah, you know, exactly. I mean, you know, it was, it was actually relatively difficult to do. I mean, I had to say, I, I ended up picking up Pearl. I, when I started doing this stuff and realized that, oh, maybe I could actually make a career out of it. I mean, cause I'd come out of the theater. I'm an ex-dancer. Um, I've got no technical background at all. And I sort of thought, oh, well, you know, I've got an arts background. Maybe I'll sort of do web design. Uh, but it turned out I'm, I'm a horrific designer really really <laughs> awful designer <laughs> um but in the sort of doing this i started to learn teach myself pearl and realized actually I, i'm not a bad developer and I, I learned pearl quite quickly considering i'd you know had no background in in programming um and sort of was basically learning you know programming concepts you know from scratch um to to do that and and pearl is not the most straightforward of languages as, as your first thing to pick up <laughs> so so <laughs> You know, it, it was was a lot harder, and you'd have to do things like, you know, you'd actually have to really set up a Linux box to, if you wanted to be able to start doing this stuff because you needed somewhere to test things. And 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 Linux back in the day was incredibly difficult to get going with. So there's this huge learning curve just to be able to like write a guest book, <laughs> which now, you know, if you want to do interactive stuff, yeah, you've got all these APIs. You can do a lot of this stuff just in the browser. You can use any number of languages, a lot of which are much more simple, and uh, sort of to get started with. Um, so yeah, I think there are things that are a lot easier to do these days, but, but in terms of what's expected now of your average yeah. website is, is a lot more than, than we were dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. It's nice to not have to, uh, ask, uh, someone if they know a, a lamp developer to get things going. Um, <laughs> we could just use all these different things and, uh, leverage headless CMSs and, uh, it, it's it's definitely changed. You know, it's on, on the same token too. Um, what do you think about like? It, it seems that people from our generation find it a little bit more. Um, I don't want to say difficult, but more of a challenge, I guess, to uh, really jump into things like Grid. Whereas it it seems to me like people that are just new to this like they could jump into grid and they just get it but like mm -hmm. like for me like it was it was a it was difficult for me to coming from like you know i i did you know i i, I could take myself like i did table designs and then you know um uh, floats and flexbox and now with grid it, it, it it's still i find it challenging like i'm it, 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 i'm I have to reprogram the way I, I think when I look at a, a layout, like I, you know, back in like, like 2001, I could look at a Photoshop file and go, oh, I know I could see the code. I see the matrix. And, you know, now it takes me a little bit more time to look at my sketch file and go, yeah, there it is. Hmm. Yeah. I, th I think, I mean, I, I found that certainly in terms of workshopping um, new CSS layout stuff is that if I've got a room full of beginners, and I say, right, this is how we do layout. And I introduce Flexbox and Grid as a sort of system for doing layout. Um, and they'll just get it because they've got no history there. Whereas people who are very used to having built layouts using floats in particular, because the way that works is you basically have to give everything a size and push it around to make it look like a grid. Um, and I think that the, the typical thing that someone does is they try to make Flexbox and Grid layout behave in the same way. And they don't really behave like that. It's hard work if you try and do that. And I see that time and time again from experienced developers just really struggling to change the way they think um, about layout. You know, now we've actually got a proper way to do layout on the web uh, because they've, they've built up, you know, years and years and years of, of hacks and workarounds and tricks that they're, they're just used to using. Um, and we all do it, you know, there's always, I'm, I'm pretty sure anyone of our generation, if you looked in our actual production style sheets, there would be things that we do not need to be doing anymore that are designed for old browsers that no one uses anymore, <laughs> but that we just learned that we had to do it. So we just keep doing it, you know? Um, so yeah, I think 
I think it is often easier. Now we have got this system and something I've been talking about a lot um, the last sort of year or so is that we do have a system for layout now. And, you know, this is what it is and this is how we use it. And so sort of trying to teach that as a complete thing rather than um, this sort of collection of hacks that we sort of understand work. Yeah, even um, things like, uh, what is it, display content. I think you did a video on this. Uh, I saw uh, a few months back where it's like display content and then you have the way you can make it work with subgrid was uh, super interesting. And that was another one that I was like, wait a minute, what? And I was like, oh, okay. Like it, it, it's, <laughs> it, it's interesting, like the, the, um, the ways that you could use uh, subgrid mm -hmm. and, and explain that to people. Do you find that a challenge, like to get people to like, you know, he here's how you leverage this? Um, I think it's harder for people just to realize how they can use it. I think we're starting to see a lot more now of people just solving problems with it and realizing that, oh, right, yes, I can do this and that. And that's starting to happen now. Um, you know, I think it's, at first everyone was just like, oh, I can line things up. That's nice. Um, <laughs> and we're now starting to see people be a bit more creative with it and actually kind of push at the edges and then we're also seeing people find things they can't do at the moment and that to me as someone on the CSS working group that's interesting because I'm like okay so here we've got some new problems that we can't yet solve and you know that's what I really like about being involved in creating new CSS is that we can solve problems and I think that you know as a developer as a programmer as someone who has sort of built stuff for years uh, the only reason to do this is to solve problems um, so I, I really enjoy it when people come to me and say yeah this grid thing's great but hey it doesn't do this yet and I'll be like right okay so what's the use case there let's see what we can do with that it's really interesting bringing up your work with the CSS working group I've always been curious um, how how does that work I mean how how did you get invited and I'm sure and, and I think I actually saw someone ask you that like how do you get invited to this thing how do I get involved and I've always been interested in in how that happens and then kind of how you work together on these things because it mm -hmm. sounds like it's probably uh, I, I work remotely so it sounds like it's probably a distributed group of, of experts mm -hmm. from everywhere that get together um, and kind of have this ongoing conversation so I'm curious about that yeah so there's there's that what must be said is that anyone can get involved with creating CSS. You don't have to be on the CSS working group to be um, okay. and talking, you know, answering um, stuff on our issues. We have all our issues on GitHub um, to be raising new issues, to be posting up use cases and talking about this stuff. There's lots of people involved with CSS who aren't actually kind of officially on the CSS working group. Um, the group is mostly made up of members or, or people who represent members who are basically uh, people, um, companies that are members of the DOE3C can then opt people onto the working group. And typically that will be people who work for browsers or print user agents. So uh, they have an interest in CSS. So they will be engineers. Mm -hmm. There's lots of browser engineers or user agent engineers on the CSS working group because they're the people who actually implement this stuff in browsers. And so it matters to them and... Um, we need their input because they can tell us if it's even possible to do this thing that we'd like to do, <laughs> you know, in the browser yeah. code itself. Um, so that's, you know, a lot of the people in the working group represent browsers. Um, there are a few invited experts, which I initially was before I started representing Frontiers. Um, and invited experts tend to be people who've done quite a bit of work and, and had quite a lot of input into the working group at various times. And um, we'll sort of get invited on a bit more officially. Uh, in my case, I started then editing specifications. Um, so I'm sort of fairly involved in, in that way as actually a spec editor. Um, but there's not many invited experts, there's a few people. Sometimes they're, they're involved because they did used to work for a browser vendor, for example, and don't anymore. And the working group are like, hang on, you're not getting away that easily. <laughs> and they'll yeah. make them an invited expert <laughs> and keep them around. Um, so yeah, so it, it's mainly people who work for these companies that have an interest. Um, and we meet up three or four times a year uh, in person, as many of us uh, that can. And we have a weekly um, telephone conference. So there's quite a lot of involvement if you're actually on the group. Um, whereas, as I say, any person out there who's interested in this stuff can follow along and, and ask questions and post up use cases and things. That That's cool. Can I ask what is maybe... I'm sorry, Sarah, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, you know, you, I just said it sounded like a lot of work. You go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm interested. Is there any kind of um, uh, 
maybe new thing on the horizon, anything that you could uh, give us like a little insight on that maybe, you know, the, I, I picture like the, the round table of Jedi's uh, talking about <laughs> that's like a, a, a new kind of thing that, the, that we've been, um, that we should know about or could start thinking about for the future or any interesting yeah. stuff like that? I mean, to be honest, most, most of the time, what we do is we sit around and we figure out error cases. That's really what we do most of the time. <laughs> so <laughs> it's less exciting than you think. Um, so no Jedi's, gotcha. <laughs> What, what happens really is that the actual kind of big idea is often relatively straightforward to say, well, yes, there is a use for this thing. People need you know, to be able to do this sort of thing. Um, and the actual major sort of component parts, the major sort of feature is quite easy to sort of say, well, you know, it should be working like this and people should be able to do that. But then it's basically all of the cases where people are going to do weird things with it or people are going mm. to try using it alongside some other CSS. You know, in fancy things, something like grid. Well, what happens if um, a floated item becomes a grid item? That's got to be defined because if it's not defined, browsers are going to do different things. Um, so it's all of that stuff is typically what we spend most of our time doing. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it, 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 it can be just an awful lot of very, very minor things, um, which you can see if you follow the, the issues list. I think from my point of view, the interesting stuff um, is the potential of things like CSS regions um, and exclusions and the sort of layouty things which um, would allow us to do much more like your sort of print type style layouts in the browser. Um, there's, there's, you know, a bunch of stuff going on. There's a, there's a lot of people who are interested in that stuff, um, but it's hard and they're big things um, to, to be working on. Uh, but that's kind of where I'm particularly interested in is whether we can get some of those things that we have, we have had. I mean, we had a region spec that was implemented in some browsers and then removed. Um, you know, I'd like to sort of see that sort of thing coming back. Um, what, what do you think so powerful about that? Like, what's the use case with the region? Um, well, it's this, it's this ability. Now we've got grid. It's like, well, if you want to, um, you know, have a, a really neat set of, of boxes that just fill your screen, for example, and then be able to fill those with content. Well, what happens if you've then got overflowing content um, and being able to say, well, OK, and well, I want to have another set of these boxes that are the same shape and put all the content into, into those, that kind of thing. I think there's a bunch of things. And then it, exclusions is... Um, is sort of this ability to have things that essentially are like a float, but text wraps all around the element. And there's tons of use cases for that in editorial design. So there's there's just a bunch of, of patterns that I think these things would be useful for. Um, and and they're, they're the sort of things that people start coming to me and saying, oh, why can't I do this? Um, and and they're not really grid problems. They they need something else. Can, can I ask you one more question that's that's layout related like this? What about the, there's a lot of people talking about like those uh, the you know the foldy phones? Oh yes, yeah. Yeah. Do we have any kind of um, ideas uh, of how that works? Like with like when I have my my one screen and then I unfold my my two screens, does it behave as one screen? Can I do certain things for that? There is there is an API. There's a second screen stuff. It's not in. It's not something I've really looked at. But there, I mean, there are definitely. Um, there's definitely work going into that, and I think we're going to see more of this sort of thing and people using other screens and so on. So it's not not in my sort of area that I've really been looking at. This sort of, I, I kind of, it, it's sort of you find even within CSS, um, we all have our things that we know a lot about. And like at the CSS working group, we're all sat around the table. Like, and I'm layout, right? So I care a lot about layout. If anyone mentions layout, then I'm going to pop up from behind my computer and take notice. <laughs> But fonts, eh, you know, I don't really do fonts. I can't really tell one font from another. So, <laughs> and pretty much everyone's kind of the same. You know, people have their little their little area they know a lot about. Um, you know, every time I need to animate something in CSS, I have to go and look up the spec because I can't remember because I don't do it often enough. It's not my thing, you know. And and yeah. so, and actually, I like to tell people that because I think, you know, you sort of average web developers like, oh, how could I ever learn all of this stuff? And you can't. You can't, and even people on the CSS working group will go, I don't know, I need to look at it. I mean, I've probably got a head start in that I'm good at reading specs, and if I need to find out, you know, I'll just open up the spec and have a look. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, as, as Rachel, the web developer, rather than Rachel, the CSS working group member, 
I am in exactly the same position as every other web developer in that I'm like, oh, I need to do this thing. And I kind of know there's a thing that does this and I have to go and find out. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, so, you know, take heart if you think, oh, how am I ever going to learn all this stuff? Because like none of us can. There's too much of it. There's way too much, way, way too much. <laughs> so I'm curious to learn more about um, your your role at Smashing Magazine. Um, Editor-in-chief, it sounds super fancy <laughs> what does that mean so as editor-in-chief like what do you do I'm really curious um so really it, it's I guess I sort of plan the direction of uh, of, of the content and of the magazine um smashing is a very tiny team I mean obviously that the magazine was, was co-founded by uh, by Vitaly Friedman who is still um really the sort of uh you know he's, he's the the founder and and really drives the full direction i think he's the heart behind smashing magazine you know um ev everything smashing has vitally all over it because you know his personality and the you know the the, the love he has for the community and, and the people who work in it um so he was editor-in-chief for a long time really since the magazine started and and he wanted to get more involved in all the other things that smashing do the books and the conferences and and it's all so brought me on sort of two years ago to guide the sort of direction of the content of the magazine so that's really what i do and that's that's a sort of editor-in-chief role really is um trying to make sure that we speak to the industry as a whole um and that the content we're putting out is is good and correct <laughs> hopefully um but also is is what people want to know about uh, and we speak to a very broad audience in terms of technology um as well as a very global audience you know we have you know when i sort of look at our stats and where people are coming from they are literally coming from every corner of the globe you know which is wonderful um so so yeah that's that's really what i'm doing is just trying to trying to put out content that's going to be useful to people. But what would you say the audience is as far as level of expertise? Can can someone still consume? Uh, let me let me preface back back in the day, back in the day, you could go to Smashing Magazine uh, and you could pick up an article that was for beginners and uh, more advanced as well. Mm -hmm. do, do you find that still to be true or is it the audience now more someone that's a little bit more savvy? I think the, the thing is with, uh, is we, you know, we, we keep mentioning there's so much stuff now to learn on the web that everyone is a beginner somewhere. Uh, and, yeah. and one of the challenges I actually have as, as editor-in-chief is reminding authors that we need beginner level content. We need beginner level content, not written for absolute beginners to the web, but for professional web developers who are learning that new thing. So, for instance, one of our most popular articles recently was something that Sarah Drasner wrote for us about moving from jQuery to Vue. For people who are used to using jQuery, wanted to learn Vue, wanted to understand how to kind of transition between the two things. That was super popular because there's lots and lots of people still using jQuery and thinking, oh, I'd really like to use one of these newer things, but I don't know how to start. Um, yeah. And it's not that they're bad developers, it's that they haven't learned this thing yet, you know, so... A lot, I think a lot of the really good content that we do is aimed at that person. It is, you know, aimed at professional web developer who needs to learn this new thing. So we don't need to explain basic programming constructs. We don't need to explain what a web browser is. Or, you know, or, or we, we can assume that this person is able to, you know, has got another point of reference at least. Um, you know, so I like articles that compare sort of two technologies, say, oh, you know, this thing. Well, here's this other thing, you know, um, but it's really hard to get authors to understand that. They think they've got to write something that's like groundbreaking and uh, and showing off some technique that's, and I'm like that, those articles are great. And, and sometimes that is a really good thing to publish, but the most popular stuff we publish is always, here's a thing that you need to learn about. And here's a really straightforward way to get started with it. They will always be the most popular things every time. Does that kind of strike a chord really with that recent um, article that you published with um, where you wrote pitching your ideas to the to publications mm. Does, did, did, did something like uh, strike you like you know what I need to write something about this yeah well I think because I often talk to people and they'll be like oh oh you know I don't think I'm good enough yet to write for smashing and I'm like seriously you know, <laughs> you know write stuff for us we, we, we want the stuff and, and also we've got a great team of editors you know people who write for us don't get 
left alone to do so you know we 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 do have people who can just send us a piece and it'll need minimal editing we also have people who we do a whole bunch of hand holding it's the first time they've written for anywhere like smashing um you know we'll go back and forth and we'll help them get it into really good shape so they come across well and we get good content um because you know learning to write technical stuff that's a skill as well you know and, and you get better as you practice it yeah writing writing is is um is an interesting thing i think i i do a lot of workshops um and i actually really enjoy doing the beginner workshops i enjoy doing those beginner talks kind of introducing people to something that they maybe have never seen before um, there's something really exciting about seeing someone discover something for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, the advanced, the intermediate, like those are those are interesting and fun, but I find a lot of times those are, are much more about look at this amazing thing that you can do. And, you know, here here's kind of an overview. And then later on, you're going to have to really dig in. You're not going to learn how to do that advanced thing um, from that article necessarily or from that that talk it's much more about kind of like you know ta -da, here's this amazing thing get excited um but those beginner ones are really grounding and they really help people kind of find a place to hold on to and, and really start mm -hmm. towards those advanced topics so mm -hmm. you know what i think is interesting uh, too is the podcast oh yes yes we just started a podcast yes. but that's my husband is doing the podcast there's some, oh. some sort of family uh, family affair going on here yes so so drew's drew's hosting the podcast um and interviewing people um how's so, it going yeah. yeah well um it's it's always seemed like a bit of a missing piece for smashing that we haven't had a podcast um and and drew really fancied doing it and um you know we're, we're kind of always up for trying new things so that's that's really where that came from and and uh yeah the people have been quite excited to see it i think you know a lot of people said oh wow yeah why have you never had a podcast this is <laughs> it seemed like an obvious thing um so yeah because obviously we have all, all these great people who write for us and 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 who speak at the conferences and we'd also like to try and you know interview some people who aren't just the, the usual suspects uh, because we do have this very global audience so it would be really nice to to interview people from from different parts of the world who are working on the web and, and find out a bit more about what they do so that that's sort of something that we're, we're going to try and do is get in touch with people who we who we know are you know working in, in different countries and have different understandings of things you know have just a different kind of community where they are and so on and, and just be able to talk to them about about what what it's like to, to do their job there. I actually think that'd be really interesting. Yeah, I was surprised that that the podcast was so new. I was I was doing some research and, and, and putting together this document. And I think even Frederick, when I when I said I was like, oh yeah, the podcast. And I said we should definitely mention that because they just started and and he's like, really? I thought they'd been around for a while. Like he, he had like invented this mm. entire history of podcasts from Smashing Magazine. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I really did. I thought I listened to it a bunch yeah. of times because yeah. I was like, we've, we've of done, course they have yeah. a, a podcast. We, we've done web, we've done quite a lot of webinars um, and things. So we, you know, we do have recorded stuff and, and uh, yeah. Vitaly does quite a lot of webinars with people and, and does webinars for the members and so on. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been good fun. And, and uh and yeah, so it would be fun to see where that goes and, and what sort of feedback we get. So say it's I like the, I days. like the I like the quality of it too, and the music's really cool. <laughs> yeah, that's that's Drew playing around. He likes doing this stuff. It's just an excuse to buy more microphones, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> 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 all, all the, in fact, I say this is a family affair. All the little voiceovers and things were done by my daughter. All the silly little voiceover um, idents and things. My 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 daughter um, is. Uh, a performer she went to um, theater school and things she dances and sings and stuff so drew was like i need to get someone to do some voiceovers i know who to ask so. <laughs> i love that That's so awesome. there we go <laughs> does he have like the setup or, or is he going to have the setup in the house like you know this is the podcast room yeah well this is the problem you see now now we're moving this is be what will happen so. <laughs> <laughs> you'll get back and there'll be the podcast room yeah, I'll not be able to move for like sound insulating board. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should uh, talk about the um, your your um, uh, the, the cssworkshop.com, the uh, all these mm -hmm. uh, workshop videos. I find this really interesting. When did you do this? Did you do this along with the book, um, uh, the yeah. new CSS layout? I kind of like to correlate with that. 
Um, yeah, well, it's sort of, it's essentially, and I'm going to be actually re-recording a lot of that stuff because I, I've, I kind of keep it in track with the in-person workshop that I do. Um, so I do um, sort of one and two day workshops, either at conferences like at Smashing, I usually do them, or sometimes in-house for, for companies. So, you know, a, a company's got a bunch of web developers, they would like to be up to speed with new layout stuff. And I'll just go in and, and teach them for a day. Um, either just go through this material I've got or a mixture of that and looking at specific problems that they've got. If, you know, if, if, if in their company they're moving say from bootstrap to, to their own framework and they need some tips or, you know, we'll, we'll work through that sort of stuff. So, so I've got all this material. And so I decided I'd, people would always be asking me, oh, you know, can, is there a way to do this online? I can't get to wherever you're doing a workshop. Um, so yeah, so I just started recording wow. it. Um, so that's really where it came from was it's essentially the material that I do there's actually a bit more than I, than I do. It, it, it's a bit more than one day's worth of, of material, but um, it's essentially that. And um, I've updated it once already, and I'm going to be updating it again as, as I sort of update my workshop for next year. Um, so I sort of keep on doing this stuff. And, and people who've sort of, um, you know, bought a, bought a registration for that just get the new stuff as I do it, really. So... Um, but yeah, that's 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 really where that came from was just having all this material and thinking, well, can I sort of use that for a wider audience? Um, yeah. So. You and you have a ton of videos on there. I, I saw it was yeah. like uh, there, there's basically like what is it, three or four sections with like forty videos a piece. Yeah, like, there's quite a lot of it. Cause they're, oh, I mean, wow. they're relatively they're relatively short because I think that you know the way I do workshops is I, I have people coding all day, so we work in code pen and with lots and lots of small examples, because then people can do a thing, see how it worked, save that as a separate thing. So like when they go wow. back to it later, they can remember what it was they did it. It's not sort of building up a whole thing yeah. where you can't remember, well, why did I use Flexbox for this or whatever? So that's really how I do it is, is with lots of small examples um, and just explaining why, you know, why various things work and what you might use them for and so on. Makes it very digestible. Do, mm -hmm. do you mind going into like what those, um, um, I don't know what we want to call the call it, but those three main sections are of all the, all the video workshops, like what um, you cover. Yeah, well, I, so I basically I do a, a bunch of things with just some sort of CSS basics that use for people to know. Um, I, at the moment, I've got it split into a sort of a, a beginners sort of area and then a, a more advanced, um, which really is a fair is fairly arbitrary, but it's kind of the the sort of stuff you need to know if you're just starting out with layout versus the sort of more complex stuff that. That if, if you encountered initially, you'd be like, ah? <laughs> so I, I sort of split it up like that. Um, and, and that's really a split that I do when I'm doing this stuff in person. It depends on who I've got in front of me. You know, if it's a room full of beginners, a lot of that advanced stuff we're never going to get to during the day because, you know, unless someone's got a specific question um, or, or they happen to be moving very quickly through, through material. Um, and then, but then sometimes, you know, I'll go and teach a group and they, they, they're all using Flexbox. They've all got a pretty good idea of this stuff. And we can go, I can kind of just go through that and go, right, okay, we've got a base, a base level here. Um, but obviously online, you don't know what people have got. So you've kind of got to put it all out there in a structured way. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, what what are one of the things that you tell people? I'd imagine, because... Uh, a lot of people ask the question like, oh, what, what should I be using right now and when should I be using it? And it's, it's really, um, and you tell me, but in my mind, it's, it's always a good idea to mix these display modes. Like if you want to have um, uh, the models, rather, if you want to have, you know, you use your grid for the things that you're going to use grid with, you use Flexbox for what Flexbox is good for. And then you, you might use a float for a thing that floats is good for yeah. and yeah. the same thing with like your your text layout like are you going to do like, like you're not going to take a paragraph and an image and try to you know make it into a grid you, you, you're just going to let that basic flow happen um what, what do you tell people when, like um that ask those kind of questions because i'm sure you get uh approach with that all the time yeah i mean this, is, this sort of flexbox versus grid question it's kind of like well just use what seems to work for your pattern that's it. there's a yeah. there's a few kind of rules of thumb um if you've got a bunch of oddly sized things and you just want them to sort of like you want to chuck them at the browser and the browser re to return the most sort of decent sort of layout for those things with equal gaps between them and so on that's kind of a flex layout flexbox is really good at taking a bunch of oddly sized stuff 
and laying it out nicely so that it's readable and, and looks sensible. If you want to impose a grid, even if it is only on one line of things, if you want it to kind of be a strict grid, you're going to have an easier time doing that with grid layout most of the time. Um, if you're sticking widths on all of your flex items or setting the flex basis on all of them, you probably want to be using grid. Um, that's a fairly good uh, sort of time to think. But, you know, they're both just values of the display property. You're using the display property. You know, use display grid, use display flex, you know, whichever sort of works. Um, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, there's not many right or wrongs. Um, CSS specs don't tell you which way to use these things. We create CSS, but the only time you'll ever see in a CSS spec a kind of, you know, do this or don't do this is around accessibility issues. If there would be a way of you using something that would cause an accessibility problem, that will tend to be in the spec. But otherwise, like, you know, we don't tell you how to use this stuff. Just use it. If it works for the pattern you're building, then you're probably okay. So I want to switch gears. We've been talking a lot about <laughs> about CSS and and um, technology. I'm really so I follow you on Twitter, um, and I know a lot of our listeners probably do. Um, and I'm always seeing you talking about your running. Um, it <laughs> yeah. kind of blows my mind because I know how much you travel. Um, I travel a lot. I'm struggling just to, to stick to a diet plan. Never mind a running schedule. So I'm really curious to hear kind of. Um, one, like what running does for you, because um, I personally hate it. Like I hate running. Don't make me run ever. Really? <laughs> I wish I loved it. Oh my God. I just, the whole time I'm running, I'm thinking of all the other things I could be doing. But I'm just curious to hear about, you know, what you love about running and then how in the world you make time um, with all your traveling. Yeah. So, well, I, I never did any sports school. So I say my background is dance. So I did dance. So I didn't really do any sport or anything like that. Um, and then I had my daughter and, uh, you know, I didn't really do very much of, of anything. And I don't know, I kind of got into running just because I thought it'd be an easy way and an inexpensive way to keep fit. You know, you just need some trainers and off you go, you know. And so um, I started running. I was terrible at it because it turns out the dancers can't run. Uh, my daughter is currently <laughs> discovering this because she's decided to train for a half marathon. And she's like, I'm so fit. I'm a dancer, but I can't run. <laughs> And so, yeah, so dancers are terrible runners for some reason. So it took me ages to actually get, I did the couch to 5K um, and eventually managed to get up to 5K and I thought, I'm never going to run further than 5K. And then someone's like, oh, there's this 10K race, you can do it. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'll do it. I'm never going to run more than 10K. Um, and then when I was, you know, standing lined up at the London Marathon, I'm like, yeah, I guess I'm a runner now. <laughs> um, so, but I, 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 I love it. I love endurance sport. Um, I I like the chance to see what sort of where the edges are of what I can do um, in terms sort of physically. And that's, it's kind of interesting. <laughs> and, and you even, uh, you do this uh, to talk about the aspect that Sarah said about time. You even do this when you're at uh, conferences. I remember oh, yeah. there was a conference uh, that you talked about with, uh, who's it? Josh Clark. He's the inventor yeah. of the couch to five. Yes. And like, and yes. you were like, yeah, I'm actually running with, with <laughs> Josh Clark, the inventor of the couch to five. Well, that's, like like uh, that's really fun. Cause I've got all these sort of running and triathlon friends who aren't web people. And so the fact that Josh is someone who I like, I know is like amazing to them because the couch to five K is famous, <laughs> you know, and so many people have started running because of it, you know, and I, I did. Yeah. And, um, so it's pretty cool that, that Josh is someone who speaks at the same conferences as me on this entirely different subject, but we can then go out for a run. But yeah, I mean, I, I so I have a coach. I do, I do triathlon as well. Um, and so for the last year, I've had a coach. She's actually in upstate New York. So she coaches me remotely. Um, so she gives me a trip. I tell her where I'm going to be. And usually once I turn up, I like, you know, wander into the gym and, and take a photo of the mismatched um, dumbbells and the terrible machines that are in there. And I'll say, right, what can I do? <laughs> and so she, she'll figure it out for me. And so I pretty much just do that plan wherever I am, you know, um, and most of the time it works out. It, it's, it's really about prioritizing it as much as anything and saying, you know, I am going to do this thing. I'm going to go out and run for an hour, two hours, whatever it is, or I'm going to get into the gym. Um, yeah. because it kind of matters to me and I, 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 I love the work I do and I could quite easily work for 18, 19 hours a day. Um, and if, yeah. and running and things gets me away from that. Um, 
I listen to lots of podcasts and lots of audiobooks. So that's when I don't get a chance to read a lot anymore because I'm always doing something. Um, but I can yeah. listen to audio. I listen to huge numbers of audiobooks while running and also while on the cycle train. As I say, I do triathlon, so I, I cycle as well. Um, uh, so I listen to all these, these books. That's great. Um, I can write an entire article in my head while I'm out for a run as well. And, wow, really? <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. And I, I, I will, I, that, I mean, a lot of my writing is written like that is I am thinking about something and thinking about something and thinking about it. Then I sit down at the computer and I'll write 2,000 words in an hour and a half. Wow. I've, all, I've already figured it all out. And so running is when I do a lot of that. You know, I'll, I'll turn off, I'll think of something, I'll turn off my audio book and I'll spend an hour just figuring out what the shape of that piece is or all that conference talk, you know, or, or whatever it is. Mm. And then when I get back, I can sit down and just type it up. <laughs> um, so running is a really good way to, you know, so I, I don't feel like it's a sort of, I should be doing something else most of the time. You know, it's like I can, yeah. it allows my brain to wander and think about this stuff. Um, and, uh, yeah. and it gets me away from the computer because otherwise I would just sit here and type. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a really yeah. important to not like to get away just... from the machine. Okay, mm. Sarah, sorry. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, it sounds just like, because I've tried running quite a few times. I've done 5Ks and mm. I mean, it's always such a slog for me. I don't know what it is, but cleaning the house, like, and I get crazy about cleaning, like where I'm moving things. And I'm, I mean, I'm working up a sweat for like five hours and I'm doing the same thing. I'm, I'm, I'm putting together a blog post for work mm. or I'm, or I'm working through a design problem that I'm thinking mm. about. And like this morning I did that. I was, I was, um, I was like, this house is a mess. And I just started cleaning it. And I was like, wait a minute. I know what I'm going to do with that target in input group. And like, I, I ran over to sketch and within five minutes I had it. So mm. I guess I have that. It's just not with running. I just, I wish I had it with running because it seems yeah. like such a great way to keep fit. Um, you know, and well, then I, I think, can brag yeah. about it. And I think because <laughs> I, I did know, a 5K. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I travel so much that actually the running is the easiest thing to do when you're on the road because pretty much yes. everywhere I run. And I, it's also the only way I see places because, I mean, yeah. like I'm flying to Vienna tomorrow. I will arrive in Vienna at about half past two in the afternoon. I've probably got time then to go for a quick run before the speaker dinner. I'm then in the conference all day the next day. So I'll probably run early in the morning, but it'll likely be dark. But in that those couple of runs I fly back on Tuesday morning so but in those couple of runs I'll see something of Vienna which I would not see if I didn't run because if I didn't run I'd sit in my hotel I'd go to the speaker dinner I'd go to the conference venue I'd go back to my hotel I'd go to the airport um, <laughs> and and so actually because I run even if I only pop out and run 5k or something which which you know it, it is a short run for me I you know I run marathons but I get to see something you know I'll, I'll run around the sites I'll go take photos on my phone at five o'clock in the morning in uh, near big sites and there's no one there um, <laughs> and that's kind of fun so actually it works very well for the travel and it lets me see places and I've had and I, I enter races when I travel I did the Chicago triathlon when I was there for event apart um, I did a, um, a half marathon in Brooklyn when we were there for smashing um, you know and get to be part of that running community somewhere where I'm working is is really good fun too mm -hmm. And it's important to have that disconnect uh, to, to get away from the screen to uh, one, just, just to literally get away from the screen to yeah. you know, avoid things like burnout, but also to, to the things that both you and, and Sarah spoke about is that you have these ideas when mm. you're away from it. These, you know, you'll have these epiphanies, like, like people talk about, like, you know, in, in the middle of the night, you'll think about, oh, that was the name of that movie or, oh, you know what? I need to use this property when I want to mm. align this to that. Like it, it's that kind of same thing. At least I find that when I run, I'm, I, I'm the most I run is about six miles, um, which is uh, 10K, yeah. uh, but I'll, I'll do like uh, 5K every other day or so. And mm -hmm. I, I really enjoy, but I'm the same way. I, 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 I need that disconnect and I try to really disconnect and I try to just focus on listening to a podcast and immerse myself on the, in the subject and just mm -hmm. really try to absorb it. And by the time I'm done, I'm like, oh, I'm already back home. And that's, yeah. that's usually what gets me through it. Yeah. I mean, it, it, people say, oh, how do you have time to do all this, this stuff, you know, all this, this fitness stuff as well as all the work that I do. And I'm like, the reason I can do all the work that I do is because of the fitness stuff that I do. You know, it's because yeah. that, because I spend, you know, an hour or two every day doing something physical, you know, and actually prioritizing that. 
um, that is what is allowing me to also have the sort of output that I have in terms of work and not be a burned out mess. Um, because, because, you know, I've, I've had that chance to do, you know, to be outside, which I find, you know, is really important to me. I love to be outside and, and doing things that, you know, sort of, sort of seeing nature and being out, being out there um, is really important. I've had that ability. And so then if I've got to sit down and work for eight hours, well, okay, you know, that's fine. You know, I'm okay yeah, with that because <laughs> you're recharged. You, you, yeah. You've been outside. You got, you know, you, you not only is it good for your mind, but it's good for your, 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 your body, your spirit, your soul mm. to, to just have that break and get to recharge. And you'll be able to be so much more productive uh, from that. Yeah. Because. And that, that's, that's really is, is, is for me is incredibly important. Um, if, I, if, if I'm injured and things and can't do stuff, I am a very, very grumpy person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear you. So the one thing we didn't so, get to talk about, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Sarah. You got something. I have a feeling we're going to talk about the same thing. I was curious about noticed. Is that what you're yes. going to talk about? Frederick? Mm. I, I okay. was, yes. Yeah, I was curious. Um, I, I found this again when I was kind of doing some research and I didn't know anything about it. And, and now I'm like, I need to be using this um, because I've been trying to collect like all these like <laughs> old web pages with my talks and try like mm. how... And it's impossible because they're, they're up, then they're down, they're gone. So I'd love to hear more about, about this. Yeah, well, I said, just like Perch was us scratching an itch that we had, you know, we, we need to say like Perch, notice is the same. You know, I basically, I'd kind of done this on my own website. I'd kind of create sort of, uh, which is which is using Perch, where I'd sort of put together this sort of speaker profile page and people would ask me, oh, you know, how did you do that? Um, and I'd say, oh, well, I just sort of put it together with Perch. But we sort of thought, well, actually, is this something that people need? Um, because all the slide sharing tools are just that, they're just slide sharing. You can upload your slides, um, but there's nowhere really to like put all the resources and the tweets that people, you know, you've seen and, um, you know, all the little bits and pieces that go along with a presentation. You, you don't really have anywhere to host all of that stuff. And so that was really the idea was to have, to be able to create your sort of speaker profile with all the things that, that you've done and the things people have said about it and, um, and to be able to sort of build that up over time. Uh, as, as a kind of resource so that was really it was it was kind of this is what I need um, maybe some other people will need it yeah. too and it, it's, a, it's a really fun project um, because people who are using it really like it um, and so we get a lot of great feedback which of course then makes it more fun to work on because you're doing stuff for people who are enjoying it um, and it's sort of growing slowly um, you know it's 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 a SaaS app it's not hugely expensive so you know it's, it's a kind of a slow curve but it's also relative to kind of self-sustaining, um, you know, it, it's been built in a way it's, it's not, not costing a fortune to run. So we're able to kind of invest more into it and things. And it was, it's, but it's actually a really nice feel good project to be honest, because it's about, you know, people doing their thing and speaking and, and, uh, and it's fun to, we're actually now building up quite a good collection of stuff on the site. If you go to the explore page, you know, there's a huge number of videos and presentations on all sorts of different topics that you can kind of browse through. So that's probably the next thing is to try and expose all of that a bit more because it's actually becoming quite a good resource for all sorts of subjects. Yeah. And is this something that I could go in and um, try to pull together old talks of mine? So yeah. look for the video and then upload yeah, the deck definitely. and then try to try to piece together all the Twitter, you know, the tweets. Yeah, a lot, of, um, yeah I mean, a lot of people have done that. We've had people go right back. I mean, they've done better than I have. I and mean, I've still got a whole load of my old talks. I haven't had a chance to put on there yet. But, you know, we, we have had people who've gone, you know, right back and, and imported all their back catalogue and and uh, which is is cool. You know, it, it's it's fun to see. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think I think it's it's a, it's a nice project. It's and say again it just came from one of these things where we're like yeah this would be useful for us maybe it'd be handy for other people too let's build it <laughs> there's, there's always the best things though if, if it solves a problem for you there's there's probably somebody else that needs yeah. it so yeah and it, yeah say it's, it's really good fun and I, I love seeing all the stuff that is ending up on it and also the as, as it goes into different kind of markets we've got a whole bunch of teachers use it and I would never kind of expected that but then there's all these sort of you know more well, sort of educational type stuff going up onto the site uh, because obviously the majority of people at the moment are kind of tech speakers because they're, they're, they're who we can reach um, but there's absolutely no reason why it couldn't be used by you know any sort of speaker so that's kind of interesting as you start to see the reach kind of trickle out to different places just because someone spotted it in a slightly different um, community you know 
kind of like the way uh, Twitch became like was started off. I think it started off as like a gaming platform, and now mm. there's a lot of people doing live shows on Twitch. It's becoming mm. a very uh, hot spot for development. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 always. I think anything that you put out there into the world, it is always fascinating what happens when real people get their hands on it and they make decisions. Then you you know your your customers make decisions about what this is. Um, and it isn't necessarily what you thought it was in the first place. And that's, that's kind of, that's one of the joys of doing this stuff is that, you know, you have all these plans and all these ideas, you know, purchase the same, you know, that the next thing we're going to do. And then the minute it gets real users, they decide what it's going to be, you know, and, and then you are left going, okay, so we, we need to serve the needs that these real people have rather than the sort of ideas that we had, they might, the things they might want. Yeah, they, they will definitely tell you what's uh, what's valuable to them mm. and, and how they could use that and uh, definitely uh, help make the product that much better along yeah. the way. And that, that, that really is that what the fun thing about product development for me is, is that, again, it comes back to this problem solving. It's that, you know, you sort of, you, you put a product out there thinking that you're solving a problem or a set of problems. Um, and you may find that actually the real problem that needs solving is yet to be uncovered um, by, by the way that people kind of try and, <laughs> hack what you've done essentially to, to make it work in a slightly different way. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, I think if, if you, if you don't enjoy that sort of thing, it, it would be hard to work in, in, you know, developing products because you kind of have to, you have to be willing to sort of go with it and, and also a allow yourself to follow what people are doing and, and see how you can make it better. Yeah. Well said. Well, Rachel, we're, we're, we're almost at the end of the show. Uh, two things that we like to ask people is, uh, first off, what what's the best way people could find out more about you? The, the website, Twitter, where should they go? Uh, so I'm um, at Rachel Andrew on Twitter and most of the places. Um, and my personal site is rachelandrew.co.uk. Um, I am terrible at answering things like direct messages on any platform because I get too many and they just sort of disappear um, <laughs> but I'm really good at email so uh, um, my, my Twitter profile has has a link to my sort of contact page on my website which um, details my email address and everything like that so um, I'm always happy for people to email me uh, that's generally the best way to get hold of me if you actually need to speak to me because I am terrible at missing tweets and direct messages <laughs> <laughs> And, and the last thing that we like to ask people is if you have any final words for our audience, any kind of uh, words of wisdom, anything that you like to, uh, uh, to, to uh, bestow upon the audience. Um, I think having talked about running a lot, you know, find a way to keep fit and get outside that you enjoy. Um, if you spend a lot of time sat at a computer, it will make things much better for you, I promise. Love that. Sarah, do you have anything else? Just that I hear you and I need to, I need to find something I like to do outside because I am the least healthy person here based on everything you <laughs> talked about. <laughs> I spend hours and hours in front of the computer um, with every excuse in the world of why that's more important than, than getting up and moving and doing the things I know I have to be doing, especially as I, as I get older. <laughs> so, we're we're going to harass Sarah about that. <laughs> Yeah, it's been, I think it's a wake up call I needed. It's why I was like, I, I got to ask her about running um, <laughs> because I need to find my thing. I need to, and cleaning mm. my house is not my thing. I need something a little bit more substantial yeah. than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, running will do it. And, well, thank you so and, much. And, and, and you could definitely do it when you uh, go to these locations that you, because uh, you travel as well a lot for work, mm -hmm. Sarah. I so, do, yeah. Yeah, you could do that too. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Rachel. Really, really appreciate you joining us. It's been fun. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, thank you. And thank you everyone for watching. Um, we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone.